Everything we've been through together and all the great experiences we've had, we've lived together. John Bon Jovi forged a five-man musical fraternity as fiercely loyal and combative as brothers. It was a gang. It was a gang against everybody. You fight these battles together, and the battles being, you know, real, real wars. It's kind of like the rock and roll mafia. Once you're in, you can never leave. <laughs> Bon Jovi's mix of metal, magnetism, and madness kept them at the top of the charts. Blue-collar New Jersey boys, they worked hard for their fans' respect. You know, nobody could be from New Jersey and make a record except for Bruce Springsteen. But um, they were so good. To this day, I mean, they're one of the, really one of the great rock bands in the world. Check this out. They were working class warriors turned rock and roll royalty, and they celebrated their success like kings. We lived that life, man, big. Of all hours of the night, drinking, having fun. Then he said, okay, I'm coming into town, come, you know, meet me at a hotel, and I'm like, no, 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 I can't do that. Lay your hands on me. To the eyes of the world, Bon Jovi looked invulnerable, but within the family, the cracks began to show. The band are drunk and high and bloated and me too I and mean, we were a wreck they were toast they didn't dig each other they weren't going to talk to each other it probably wasn't going to be a bon jovi after that had all the success that you could ever ask for and yet i wasn't happy this ain't a song for the broken hearted the Bon Jovi Brotherhood broke apart, but not for long. Somebody says, like, oh, that's it, the band's broken up. It'll be back, because it was just too big, and it was too good. It's my life, it's now, now, New Jersey's most notorious musical mob tell their tale of luck, loyalty, dedication, and debauchery. It's my life. Bon Jovi, behind the music. people that have grown up now that are that are leaders of industry or professional quarterbacks or guys in the White House that'll tell you how one of our songs influenced and moved and you know did something for them. They go, wow, who knew? In the early 80s, Bon Jovi exploded from hard rocking New Jersey club favorites to become the biggest band in the world. The seed of Bon Jovi was the New Jersey street rock and roll, the Springsteen model. But John added this element of heavy metal bombast. Southside Johnny and Bruce Springsteen, the Jay Giles band, that was the music that I related to. These were the characters I wanted to grow up to be. I have Italian kids from New Jersey. Exit 10. I have a bunch of hits. Go away for a while. Then they come back. Happy ending. Album sales topped 80 million, and every one went platinum. They charted 10 top 10 hits. Bon Jovi! Eight of them from 1986 to 1989. But Bon Jovi was always more than a band. They were family. These are guys who grew up, lived in the same city. Hence, there was a family, you know, Italian. This is like the Sopranos, for God's sakes. <laughs> I wear this charm that's very, you know, close and meaningful to the organization. And when you get this, you're now part of the brotherhood. So I've seen, you know, these grown men, these rough guys, get this medallion and cry.
John was born on March 2nd, 1962, the eldest of three sons born to John and Carol Bon Jovi. John's family settled in Sayreville, New Jersey, a working class town 30 miles south of New York City. Life in Sayreville taught John a valuable lesson. You kept family business within the family. Everyone knew everybody. Uh, you couldn't get away with much in that town because it would get around pretty quick. Still barely in his teens, John began jamming with several local bands and hanging out in the Asbury Park nightclubs that spawned legendary Jersey rockers like Bruce Springsteen and Southside Johnny. There was no mamby-pamby music. But if you really wanted to stick out, you really had to work hard on stage. And that's one of the lessons that we all learned, Bruce and John and I, that if you didn't go up there to kick ass, you'd get your ass kicked. In 1979, John formed the Atlantic City Expressway. One of the first to audition was a 17-year-old high school kid, keyboard player David Bryan. John and I got introduced because he went to Sarville High School and I went to J.P. Stevens over the bridge. The Expressway was a moderate hit with the Jersey locals, but it was John who commanded the spotlight. I remember Springsteen coming to one of his shows where he's playing at the Fast Lane in Asbury Park. I was 15, I'm going, you gotta be kidding me. You know, this is like surreal. He was always the, the one you watched. It always seemed to me like he was more deeply involved in rock and roll and more dedicated to it and willing to do whatever it takes to make it right. I would go into school in the morning after being in a bar till three in the morning and I'd show up at eight and would doze off. All I could think about was getting a rehearsal after school. But John did find something to interest him at school. In his senior year, he met a girl named Dorothea Hurley and fell in love. She sat next to me in history class. We got to know each other a bit. We got together, and uh, I just held on with two hands and never let go. John had a steady girl and a steady gig, but he wanted more. In 1980, he got a job at New York's legendary Power Station Studios. I'd have to go to the bank, go to OTB and place bets, go to the cleaners, go for a burger, you know, whatever somebody wanted. Oh, he's a nice kid, you know, he's sweeping up or something, you know, <laughs> getting, getting coffee, I don't know. I was like, that's, dude, that rules, man, you know, I have a recording studio that Ozzy Osbourne does records at, you know. And then he takes me up there, and, and I open up the elevator, and there's Mick Jagger. And I'm going, duh. Hungry for a record deal, John wrote and recorded over 50 demos from 1980 to 83. He was never shy about self-promotion. Bon Jovi band right here. We have a date or two to plug to announce where you'll be appearing live in yeah. the future. On September 3rd, we'll be at Zappa's in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, we'll be at the Fountain Casino coming shortly. And uh, check the Aquarian for more dates. In 82, John recorded a demo of a song he wrote called Runaway. Nothing came of it until I went to a radio station in New York called WAPP. At the time, WAPP was New York City's cutting-edge rock radio station. In 83, a DJ put Runaway on a station-sponsored album of local artists. 